Welcome to our webinar, Challenges of Sepsis Diagnosis, Harnessing the Host Response. Sepsis Alliance gratefully acknowledges the support provided for this webinar by Immune Express. Sepsis Alliance develops sepsis awareness and education programs. We've recently updated our mission statement to show our commitment to saving lives and reducing suffering by improving sepsis awareness and care, both for the public and for healthcare providers. And I'm so excited to introduce our speaker for this webinar. Dr. Stephen LaRosa is an infectious diseases physician at Beth Israel Leahy Health System. He currently serves on a number of medical advisory boards, clinical trial steering committees, and more for experimental agents, devices, and diagnostics in infectious diseases. Dr. LaRosa, thank you so much for presenting today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, thank you, for everybody, for joining me during these uh, difficult times with COVID-19 for an educational opportunity. And um, what we're going to learn about today is a new approach to sepsis diagnosis. So I'd like to start off with the traditional diagnosis of sepsis, which uh, it was many years old, the so-called SEP1 criteria, which were put together by a group of experts for the purposes of trying to establish a homogeneity of patients for testing novel agents uh, in sepsis. And the original sepsis criteria required the presence of an infection in concert with evidence of a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS, which was categorized by hyperthermia or hypothermia, tachycardia, tachypnea, and leukocytosis or leukopenia. So having two of those four criteria in concert with infection yielded the diagnosis of sepsis. And when there was an associated end organ failure, uh, that was called severe sepsis, and that could be shock, acute respiratory failure, and dialysis. So that was, that was the starting point for clinical trials and the clinical description of the syndrome that we call sepsis. Now, it's, it gets very complicated, because, and, and it's best shared by this, uh, showed by this Venn diagram. So you can see there are many patients who have infection who do not have sepsis. Not everybody who has sepsis has evidence of a bacterial infection. Not everybody with sepsis has bacteremia. They're not synonymous. And then there's a huge overlap between SIRS and sepsis. And as I will go on to describe, there's a number of non-infectious conditions uh, which can uh, cause SIRS and can look identical to sepsis. And this tends to be a slide that I've used many times over the years for teaching purposes to, to give a, a sense of the vast number of non-infectious disorders that can cause SIRS. These could include uh, patients who have recently been traumatized or undergone surgery, who have a thrombosis or hematoma, who've had an MI or PE. Pancreatitis is probably one of the most well-characterized cause of, of sterile SIRS severe burns. There are also some metabolic syndromes, including thyrotoxicosis and Addisonian crisis, which can look for all the world like sepsis. Reactions to blood products, as well as to medications, including IL-2 uh, and CD28 monoclonal antibodies. There are malignancies. Renal cell carcinoma is probably the most well-known cause of a SIRS-like syndrome, and, and you can also see it in tumor lysis syndrome, and it's not uncommon for patients who've had a subaroid, arachnoid hemorrhage with a, a bleed into the ventricles for them to manifest themselves as SIRS. So the, the SIRS diagnosis is not, uh, uh, is, is overly sensitive. Uh, I'm borrowing a, a, a classic quote from Jean-Louis Vincent here, which he described, dear SIRS, you are overly sensitive. And this was this was well known very early on in this publication in 1995, where they looked at patients admitted to general hospital wards as well as the ICU. They had over 3,700 patients in the study. 68% uh, of those hospitalized patients met the diagnosis of SIRS, yet only 26% uh, were ultimately diagnosed with sepsis. So just think about if you are the sepsis coordinator on the floors or the rapid response team having to respond to this many uh, uh, calls for potential sepsis, yet uh, a much smaller population actually has it. That would cause an immense amount of uh, 
alarm fatigue. Then you run into the problem of infection, which is central to the diagnosis of sepsis. Uh, even with the best uh, new techniques, traditional cultures still take 24 hours to 72 hours to yield a positive uh, isolate uh, on the, in the agar plates or the blood culture bottles. A lot of patients have received either prior oral antibiotics at home or a dose or two of parental antibiotics in the emergency room prior to cultures being taken. This lessens the yield of those cultures for the comp uh, compounding the pro problem. As I mentioned before, bacteremia is not uh, synonymous with sepsis. In fact, through many, many studies, only about 30% of patients with sepsis will actually have positive blood cultures. So you can't you can't hang your hat on having a positive blood culture for making the diagnosis of sepsis. And then in this publication in CHEST in 2016, of almost 7 million patients admitted with sepsis, almost 50% uh, were culture negative, meaning they never, you never yielded a positive culture. So the diagnosis of infection as part of making the diagnosis of sepsis is very difficult. And to make things more difficult for all of us, uh, it's really it's recommended that all patients uh, get antibiotics within hours, one hour of the diagnosis. Um, so time is really not on our side. Now, more recently, there has been an update of the sepsis uh, definition. Uh, it's a much better description in that it's called a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated post response to infection. So this is, we've gotten away from a hyper inflammatory or hyper immune or cytokine storm response. We now know that actually uh, immunoparalysis can occur early on and it's really a dysregulated immune response that's the problem in sepsis. And for this diagnosis, uh, inside the ICU, you need an increase of two or more points in your so-called SOFA score, sequential organ failure assessment, assessment score, or outside the ICU, uh, the utilization of the quick SOFA score, the QSOFA, where you have at least two or more points, uh, and they're taken from the variables in the last three bullet points, having hypotension with the systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 100, and altered mental status is indicated by a low Glasgow coma scale, or tachypnea um, with a respiratory rate greater than 22. So having two or more, two or, or three of those gives you uh, the diagnosis of sepsis by the Q-SOFA score outside the ICU. Well, this study uh, by Anand uh, and colleagues published in CHEST in 2019 um, indicates the shortcomings of the this new scoring system. So they had over a, hundred, uh, a million patients that they evaluated at 85 hospitals. And the sensitivity of QSOFA for sepsis was 63%. So that meant, meant about one third of people with sepsis are QSOFA negative. So that's a fairly large false uh, negative uh, rate, um, kind of uh, troubling. And then in terms of positive predict predictive value, it was only 17%, which means that only one in six of the patients who had a positive QSOFA score had sepsis, or to flip that around, it means you're giving 83% of patients uh, early unnecessary antibiotics for a positive QSOFA when they don't have sepsis. So uh, both on a sensitivity side as well as a specificity side, uh, uh, the QSOFA really has not helped all that much. So what else have people tried to do? They've tried to get into single biomarkers that would be predictive of who has sepsis or is gonna go on and develop sepsis. And some we have at our disposal uh, fairly easily. So we, we, for instance, we have the absolute neutrophil count to absolute lymphocyte count ratio. That's part of your standard CBC and a, and a ratio more than 10 in some studies has been predictive of sepsis. Having lymphopenia with an absolute lymphocyte count less than a thousand uh, is also uh, been found to be somewhat helpful, as is eosinopenia with an absolute eosinophil count less than 40. You get a red cell distribution width with your standard CBC, and in some studies, more than 14.5% or 15% have been 
uh, helpful in the diagnosis of sepsis. A CRP we'll talk about more, but that's an, a fairly easy test to get at, at any hospital, as is a uh, ESR. For some of the markers that are available, you need special uh, platforms, uh, including procalcitonin, which we'll talk a lot more about during this presentation. Uh, immature granulocytes uh, being more than 2 or 3% uh, have been indicative of sepsis, but you need a specific hematologic analyzer to, to run that. It's not standard on all, on all analyzers. Same is true of monocyte distribution width. And uh, finally, for endotoxin activity assay, you need a, a completely different platform in machine, and it's fairly labor intensive. There's a whole host, and I couldn't, uh, I could, I could fill numerous screens with the proposed single biomarkers uh, that are have been bandied about in the literature, but they're not ready for prime time and not obtained uh, regularly. So to talk more about CRP, which you're probably uh, very familiar with, it's readily available, fairly cheap. The problem is it has a long half-life and stays up for days after surgery or trauma. Uh, it's not specific for uh, inflammation due to infection. It goes up in uh, neoplastic uh, conditions, particularly in metastatic neoplastic conditions, as well as in most rheumatologic uh, illnesses. And it also goes up in adverse drug reactions. So drug fevers, you'll see an elevated CRP. So again, problems with specificity. In this study in 2004 by Castelli and colleagues, a cutoff of 90 had a fairly good uh, uh, combination of sensitivity and specificity as indicated by the area under the receiver-operated oper receiver characteristic curve of 0.794 for distinguishing non-infectious SIRS from, from sepsis. Procalcitonin, you're probably familiar with it as well. It's FDA approved, but it's not available at all sites. It's an improvement on CRP in that it has a shorter half-life, so it does not stay up as long following uh, trauma or surgical insult, uh, not affected by neoplasms or rheumatologic disorders. And its uh, AUC to ROC curve is better at a cutoff of one to two nanograms per ml uh, at 0 0.85 for distinguishing SIRS from sepsis. So an improvement on the CRP. But procalcitonin itself has some shortcomings in that there are other conditions uh, that can cause it to be elevated, including medullary thyroid uh, cancer, small cell lung cancers, carcinoid tumors. There's a variety of, medication, uh, of medications, including rituximab, which we see used more and more these days. It does go up immediately after trauma or surgery. It's difficult to, to use in the neonatal period because it goes up in the first 48 hours of life. And there is a rheumat one uh, rheumatologic condition, adult onset Stills disease, uh, where classically it is elevated. So not ideal. So what is a, a new approach and what we'll spend the, the rest of the time talking about today? This is to try to understand sepsis response at the transcriptional level of mRNA. So you can actually isolate RNA from leukocytes. You can hybridize it place it on, analyze it on a chip, quantify the RNA changes that you see, and align these changes into a signaling pathway analysis. So you're not depending on a single biomarker, but a host gene response in the, at the level of transcription. And how do you do this? So uh, septicite lab, uh, which is, is one uh, example of uh, this gene expression approach to sepsis. I'm going to describe the, the derivation of the test, which uh, occurred in five ICUs in Australia. They collected blood samples in PAX gene RNA tubes so that you can actually isolate the RNA. And in, and in this initial derivation study, you had 74 cases of sepsis and 31 post-surgical non-infectious inflammatory inflammation cases. And they were able to identify four mRNAs uh, that were indicative of sepsis. I won't get into them, but they're all involved in, in immune uh, function. And they found these four. And they were actually able to validate by reverse quantitative PCR in 
five independent cohorts in 345 patients in the Netherlands, uh, this, uh, this set of uh, mRNAs that would be predictive of sepsis. This is in the MARS consortium in the Netherlands. And what they found is that over a number of different validation cohorts, the sensitivity and specificity as indicated by AUC to ROC was quite good. It ranged between 0.85 and 0.95. And the nice thing about these curves were they were not affected by disease severity uh, as indicated by uh, Apache uh, four scores or the SOFA score. And consistently across multiple cohorts, the septicite lab AUC to ROC was consistently higher uh, uh, by at least 0.10 to 0.17 compared with procalcitonin. The AUC to ROC curve also had, uh, was also improved over combinations of multiply commonly used markers of uh, infection. And a particularly a striking uh, finding of this uh, study was that having a septicite score less than four, so the score you can range from zero to 10, but having a score less than four had a negative predictive value of 98.8%. So how does that help you as a, a clinician? Well, if the pretest probability of a patient having sepsis is 30%, having a score less than four gave you a post-test probability of 1.2%. So it made you much better at the diagnosis of sepsis or ruling out the diagnosis of sepsis by having this uh, lab result in hand. So the early conclusions from this uh, derivation and validation study was that the septicite lab could differentiate sepsis from non-infectious systemic inflammation reliably and it had a high negative predictive value. You didn't require the identification of an infected microbial pathogen, so all the issues around the, the infect, making the infection diagnosis of sepsis have gone away. The test performed well, uh, irrespective of what the disease severity was. So it wasn't confounded by, you didn't have to have uh, necessarily high disease severity for the test to work. And it had diagnostic utility beyond what was currently available. So that's the discussion that you typically have with your lab uh, at your hospital is, is what added benefit do you have uh, above and beyond what you already uh, have present at the, at the lab? Uh, but there, based on this early study, we're gonna require further validation and subsequent studies. And you're gonna need to incorporate this into uh, uh, a rapid automated platform that's user friendly where you can actually get your get your uh, answer back in a time frame uh, that's going to be actionable. So I'd like to dive a little deeper into the subsequent studies, including the validation study for this uh, uh, this assay. So here's uh, the first study I'd like to talk about. This is Verboom and colleagues from the Journal of Critical Care. They were assessing the performance of this. Uh, assay in a pilot study of 370 patients who had esophagectomy. And they collected a PAX gene tube in, in the immediate postoperative period and also at the time patients, uh, if they went on to develop a complication. So the, what they wanted to see is what, what is the normal range for a, a septicite lab result in the postoperative period? What, does, what, sh what happens in terms of the delta uh, over time as complications develop? And to also see if the septicite lab could discriminate infectious from non-infectious complications and also compare it to the CRP in this setting. So they had 370 patients of which 120 went on to develop complications. And for 63 of those, they had both a immediate post-op sample and they had the complication time point sample so they could actually look at the temporal, um, uh, the temporal changes. There were 34 of those complications were confirmed infections. And at least in terms of the results of the immediate post-operative septicite lab result, it was uh, 2.3 uh, as a median went into quartile range of 1.4 to 3.1. Uh, 26% were in band two, meaning they had a septic score, septicite score of uh, 
3.1 or greater. And what they found is at least the immediate post-operative sample, uh, there was no significant difference in the patients who would go on to develop complications versus those who were non-complicated. So levels do go up in the post-operative uh, setting. We know what those are, and they're, at least at that initial time point, you couldn't predict uh, who uh, was going to go on and develop complications. But the second point of the of this um, study was uh, actually very interesting in terms of looking at uh, the delta change from the immediate postoperative sample to the complication sample. And what they found was the delta or the rise was much greater in those who went on to develop a confirmed infection, going up by about 4.7 points on average, compared to 2.1 in the non-infectious complication, highly statistically significant, and that the AUC to ROC curve for going on to discriminative ability for predicting infection was very high at 0.87 compared to uh, CRP, which was lower at 0.76. And this is, I, I, this is uh, hard to look at it graphically, which you can see as the score goes up from zero to 10, you can see roughly at about five, you're getting more and more patients who had confirmed infection uh, having those scores. So interesting data in a surgical population. So let's move on to uh, the uh, study that was done by Costa Brower in a medically, mechanically ventilated ICU patient population. So this was a nested cohort study. These were ICU patients who required mechanical ventilation, but it did not include people for who you already knew they were infected or you already knew they were intubated for a non-infectious reason, since you're trying to really get at the discriminative, discriminative ability of the, of the test. Again, PAX gene tube collected within the patient's arrival in the ICU within 24 minutes. And the sepsis lab was placed in four bands uh, of increasing likelihood of infection. Typically, band one is considered, uh, is less than 3.1 and considered low likelihood of infection. And they had an independent adjudication committee that uh, judged whether a patient uh, was ruled out for infection, confirmed, or in, indeterminate. And here's how uh, things uh, broke out. Sepsis band one, again, is sepsis unlikely. And you can see that uh, uh, in the infection confirmed, very few patients were in the, in the uh, unlikely band. Uh, which is good, as well as in band two, which is the lower uh, range of the score, and many more patients in band three and band four. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you did have uh, some patients who uh, were in the infection ruled out, uh, who were in the uh, low band as well. So if you put this into terms that a clinician would uh, want to uh, look at, and you just look at infection confirmed versus infection ruled out, Infection was present overall in 42% of the overall population of the study, but if you just compare these two groups, it was in 59.3% of the overall population. So how does this test improve upon what we call your pre-test probability to your post-test? So if the, if the sepsis score was elevated, uh, it, it, if it was more than uh, 3.1, it, 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 it improved your pretest probability from 59.3 to 63%. So not great, but if you look at the negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.22, it, it actually more than dropped in half uh, your, your probability of having an infection with a, a low score, a band one score from 59.3 to 24%. So again, recurring theme of a low uh, septicide score uh, being quite helpful uh, in, in ruling out uh, sepsis. Now, I'd like to get to the, uh, the, the largest validation study that's been done of this technology. Um, this was a, a study done by Miller and colleagues published in the, in the Blue Journal in 2018. Uh, it, its goal was to distinguish sepsis from SIRS on the first ICU day in a critically ill population. They had multiple cohorts here. Uh, they had uh, a critically ill population in the United States from seven sites, the, the so-called Venus study, 249 patients. Uh, 
Plus, they had uh, a, a cohort from the Mars Consortium from the Netherlands, another 198 patients. They had PAX gene tubes for RNA measurement collected within 24 hours of ICU admission. And for their uh, cutoffs, they used 3.1 to determine sepsis by the score, but they also wanted to look at the uh, ability of the test to give evidence of infection based on bands. So again, there's four bands, a score of zero to three, 3.1 to 4.4, 4.5 to 5.9, and six to 10. And again, in this study, there was also an independent uh, retrospective physician diagnosis. So three independent uh, clinicians, and uh, they gave three scenarios. So a sensitivity analysis, if you will. So one was forced where uh, you, you actually had to uh, say, was there sepsis or, what, or was this SIRS? You were, the, the adjudicators were, had to force somebody into that, one of the two categories. So that's really the lower bound estimate of the performance of the test. Consensus is when two out of the three panelists agreed, so that's probably more realistic in real life. And then there was unanimous, where all three uh, panelists uh, agreed uh, or, uh, they dis or they all disagreed. And so here's how uh, things broke out in terms of the performance of the test. So the, by the uh, review committee, in the unanimous group, there were about 41% of patients were adjudicated as sepsis. In the consensus group, it was closer to 44. And in the forced uh, consensus group or forced group, it was 45.2. But regardless of how the adjudicators uh, uh, scored the presence or absence of sepsis, the AUC to ROC uh, curve of the septicite lab score uh, performed well. And similarly, it was between 0.82 in 0.89. But again, I like to focus on Bayesian analysis because it tells you how does a test make you a better clinician? So the positive likelihood ratios range between 1.39 and 1.44, meaning they increased a bit the, that a test result would, would make you a better clinician in terms of diagnosing the presence of sepsis. But what was actually quite telling was that the negative likelihood ratios were quite low. And so, for instance, based on the result of having a low septicide score, uh, you went from a pretest probability of 41%, sorry, I advanced one, 41% down to 7%, 44% down to 11%, and 45.2 down to 16%, indicating that this test result really improved your diagnostic ability about, above and beyond clinical criteria. This is another way to view the data. This is actually those three adjudicated groups by the presence of sepsis or SIRS at the different bands. And I show you this only to indicate that as your band goes up, as your, as your score goes up, the likelihood of having sepsis goes up. So as you go from band one, two, three, and four, and that's true in all of the cohorts. So it's particularly uh, valuable when you start getting up at these high scores that sepsis is very likely. This, this paper, I, and I encourage you to read it, has, is very dense with the amount of data it's in, but as, a, as an infectious disease physician, uh, one of the, uh, actually one of the most interesting findings was there was only one, uh, there were no patients with bacteremia that in any of these was in band one. So very good at ruling out bacteremia, which again, from an ID perspective, is fascinating. Now, uh, the other nice thing, and this is data that's actually in the appendix of the, of the study, not in the body of the study. It's, it's talked about in the, in the discussion, but the AUC to ROC of the uh, assay did not vary widely depending on race uh, or gender. That still uh, was, was in excess of the AUC ROC was still in excess of 0.80. As an infectious disease physician, I was also fascinated by this data, which it, did, it didn't matter that the, if you measured the D statistic to compare the performance of the uh, septicite lab result by site of infection, uh, there was no statistical difference in the, in the performance of the score, whether it was uh, an abdominal infection or pneumonia, abdomen or, abdomen or urine, urine or other infectious site. 
Now, in, in contrast, there was a statistically significant difference in the septicite lab between di a diagnosed infection and a SERS population. So no infection site identified the septicite score was always statistically uh, significantly uh, greater. So uh, it, it's not like the, you could only use this uh, lab test based on one site of infection or, or it, it performed better in one than another. The, uh, another feature of this uh, study was they compared uh, the performance of uh, scores using the septicite, uh, the septic score in the AUC compared to procalcitonin containing uh, scoring systems or a variety of clinical uh, laboratory markers using uh, multiple logistic regression. And the septicite score, scores containing, uh, containing the septicite score always had AUC to ROC uh, ratios uh, above and beyond procalcitonin and above and beyond other clinical values, indicating that uh, this is not just another nice to have uh, uh, test, right? So it, it, it does appear to offer uh, information, diagnostic information above and beyond what is clinically available. So here is uh, one of the uh, things I mentioned earlier. So you had in this septicite lab, you had a uh, you need you needed multiple instruments, multiple lab consumables, uh, an experienced person performing the assay. It took uh, 90 minutes with 64 uh, minutes of uh, manual 64 manual procedures, and the turnaround time was six hours. So. Not very, uh, overall, not very attractive from uh, a lab's point of view, probably not from a clinician's point of view in terms of how am I going to actually put this into place in my hospital. So what's been developed now is the Septicite Rapid, which is on the IDILA platform. I'm going to go into it more, but this is the console or the testing. This, uh, this is the console. This is the, the testing of, uh, part of the apparatus. Fewer lab consumables, you only need one room. It's fully, fully automated. So sample to result. All you need is uh, anybody, uh, one manual procedure uh, by anybody who's certified to handle blood. And the turnaround time is actionable in, in terms of one hour. And again, here's what it looks like. Here's the sample, the blood sample that goes into a cartridge that's inserted into the machine. And you get a a readout on the screen. This IDILA platform, it uh, turns out, and I, this was interesting to me as a clinician, it's often present at, at a number of uh, centers already for other assays. So uh, you, may, you may already have it um, in terms of the, the platform this would be running on. And again, it performs all the steps. You add the sample, there's homogenization, lysis, DNA and RNA extraction, amplification and you get a, a written readout with the actual septic score. And that uh, is my presentation. I thank you for your attention. I hope you all stay well during this trying time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. LaRosa. Um, we do have a couple of questions from the audience already and folks in our audience, if you do have a question, please feel free to enter it into the Q&A box and we'll get through as many as possible. So Dr. LaRosa, the first question is, how does lactic acid rate determine sepsis and what about giving patients albuterol? Does that give a false positive of sepsis? Uh, so, so lactate has been very useful in the diagnosis of cryptogenic shock. Uh, there's often people who are suffering hypoperfusion of organs, yet they uh, uh, don't have hypotension. So it's very good. And certainly an elevated lactate that's not coming down is prognostic. A lactate that is coming down in uh, uh, following your fluid resuscitation antibiotics is very favorable. Uh, and uh, to answer the other question about, it was about albuterol in the score or albuterol and lactate? I, I missed that part. Um, the question was, how about giving patients albuterol? Does that give a false positive of sepsis? For the sepsis score, it would not. Because again, again, this is genetic, uh, genetic expression. So you're looking at signaling pathways and uh, albuterol doesn't affect those. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. Our next question, um, could you give an example of how this test might be used in the ER? Sure. So you, you have a patient uh, that comes in, uh, they have SERS criteria, they, they're tachycardic, they're febrile, they may even be um, uh, hypotensive. You can't you can't find by physical exam or radiograph uh, an inciting uh, uh, source of sepsis, yet you, you uh, suspect it. Your CRP is hard to interpret because the patient has a rheumatologic condition or a neoplasm, um, and they may have also had some recent trauma, and, and the labs are kind of all over the place in terms of there's not a clear leukocytosis. So it's, it's really in that band where you, you suspect sepsis, but your common clinical gestalt is not helping you. Your physical exam and your initial labs are not helping you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions regarding septicite and um, using it with COVID-19 patients. Number one, could septicite be used to detect viral sepsis in COVID-19 patients? And then could you talk a little more generally about sepsis in the coronavirus outbreak period? Right. So, uh, you know, the, typically what people have seen with COVID-19 is at least initially early on, it tends to be a monomicrobial uh, infection, meaning unlike, unlike influenza where 30% of people have concomitant bacterial pneumonia, at least early on, COVID patients tend to have just uh, the COVID uh, infection. Um, in terms of how you'd potentially use this, I have not uh, uh, seen the data um, uh, in terms of people uh, using the SEPTA score in COVID infection, but I would uh, surmise based on the signaling pathway that it's describing that you should see a difference in the SEPTA score in patients with viral infections, meaning they should be lower compared to those with being sepsis. But then again, that's just based on what I know about the test. I cannot, I have not seen any specific data myself. Okay, thanks very much. Let's move on to our next question here. Um, why was the performance lower in the respiratory patient cohort? So yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That was a, uh, a smaller uh, study compared to the Miller study that I showed. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have a particular answer for why there is a difference between those two studies. Okay, let's move on to our next question here. Is the goal of the platform to prevent unnecessary antibiotic treatment? Uh, well, I mean, you have, to, you have to actually do studies similar to what's been done with other markers to say that using a score actually allows you to, um, to safely discontinue antibiotics um, that uh, that would be that would be a great value, and it, yes, there's great and a potential antibiotic stewardship value. In my mind, as somebody who does a, has done a lot of stewardship, uh, the negative predictive value of the of the test is is very good. But you also need to um, consider, and it's something that we've talked about in other settings. You know, uh, changes in the score over time, right? You you probably need more than one time point if you were gonna if you were going to start using a score to, you know, stop antibiotics. Great. Thank you. Our next question here. So do you see septicite becoming part of a routine workup for the patient with suspected SERS or sepsis? Well, I, I think uh, the first thing is there is a, a study going on now to uh, that's required to get the rapid test approved. So we have to, you know, uh, be sure, and so far the early data would suggest that it performs, uh, this, the septicite lab and the septicite rapid are very, they're correlated very well. So you have to have that to, and you have to have experience from some uh, active, active patients. Uh, once you have that, I think um, the data I've showed you was that the assay provides information above and beyond what you have clinically available today in terms of biomarkers.
uh, and other lab tests and clinical findings. And so I think it would be just one more uh, uh, tool that would have added a value in, in predicting sepsis uh, uh, or di defining sepsis above and beyond what we have. Okay, fantastic. Um, so we are running out of time here, Dr. LaRosa. But do you have any final thoughts or conclusions before we close up the webinar today? No, I think uh, uh, I think we all wait with great anticipation to see the performance of the rapid platform. Um, there's also going to be a world, real life uh, experience with those who have the IDILA platform. Uh, see how feasible using the test is. So I think we're we're quite uh, you know waiting anxiously to get uh, further data, and and hopefully we'll have a, another tool at our disposal for rapid diagnosis. Okay, fantastic. And, and thank you so much, Dr. La Rosa, for taking time out of your schedule, especially during such a critical time to speak with our group today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope everyone stays well. Great. And folks, thank you for being on with us today. Before we close, I'd just like to quickly go over a few resources that Sepsis Alliance offers. You can find all these courses at the Sepsis Institute, which is an online learning platform that provides healthcare providers with high quality, evidence-based sepsis education. You can complete the courses at your convenience and earn CE credits. We're adding new content every week like sepsis, first response, a training module which addresses new sepsis criteria and provides expert commentary as to how these criteria can be applied in the field of emergency response. Visit sepsisinstitute.org to join, earn RN CE contact hours, and learn more. We encourage you also to join the Sepsis Coordinator Network, which supports ongoing communication, education, and network building among active health professionals passionate about improved sepsis care. Resources include webinars, a discussion forum, and a resource drive with a variety of printable and downloadable materials. Visit sepsiscoordinatornetwork.org to learn more. And Sepsis Alliance and the Sepsis Institute offer a variety of resources to help your practice and educate the public, including ones dedicated to information surrounding COVID-19. Visit sepsisinstitute.org to find a dedicated COVID-19 and sepsis page for healthcare providers. Sepsis Alliance also provides a COVID-19 informational page for the public, an informational video on COVID-19, sepsis information guides, posters, infographics, and more. You can also stay up to date on COVID-19 related news and more by signing up for the newsletter at sepsis.org. And just as a reminder, the information in this webinar is intended for educational purposes only. And thank you again for attending today's webinar. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. In a moment, a link to a survey will appear on your screen and we'd certainly appreciate receiving your feedback. Please feel free to contact us with any questions and we hope you have a great day. Thank you.